Good morning, everybody. Good morning. I think we're ready to get started. <clears throat> it's a beautiful day. I hope you all are ready for another big day. Yesterday was certainly packed uh, nonstop from beginning to end, but uh, I've heard nothing but good things from everybody, and I hope that we're able to meet the same expectations today. Um, as I mentioned, it's going to be just as busy as yesterday. We're going to have plenary sessions all morning. Uh, once again in the afternoon, we'll be in breakout sessions and workshops and a, a few more tours, so please consult your guide, uh, decide what you want to do this afternoon. Uh, I do want to point out, we're going to have a closing reception uh, for this celebration at 5.15, and it's going to take place upstairs on the patio uh, to take advantage of this uh, beautiful weather. And the reception is also going to double as the closing reception for the Society of Fellows uh, Summer of Activity. So we'll have a really good crowd here to allow the, the folks from SOF to get a little bit of a taste of what you've experienced over the last two and a half days. Uh, I do want to also point out that this morning we're going to have a 20-minute break at 1020. So uh, that'll give you a little bit of time to uh, have a rest and have some chats uh, before we get right back into everything. And you'll also notice on your uh, tables there, there are cards about the VR experience that's taking place in the gym. If you haven't experienced that yet, we definitely encourage you to do so. I think you could uh, hear from some of your, your fellow attendees about uh, just how uh, interesting and enjoyable that is. So please check it out. Um, and my last uh, admonishment before I get off the stage is to silence your cell phones. Uh, we want to make sure that we remind you to do that before everything gets started. Um, but with that, it's truly my pleasure to introduce Robert Weisenberger. He's the Associate Curator for Contemporary Pro Projects at the Clark Art Institute. And he'll be talking to you about how Bauhaus is it. So please welcome Robert. Thank you. Good morning. Thanks to the Aspen Institute for hosting. I was last here as a college freshman, and I'll skip by this slide rather quickly. <laughs> but I was here on the trail of Herbert Beyer and the Bauhaus. And I must confess, as a sort of nerdy confession, I was also quite seduced by this place, by the Institute, as a vigorous marketplace for ideas and also for its stunning natural setting. So I'll start with a basic observation, and one that may be familiar to you after the last uh, day or so, that uh, almost everything now is called Bauhaus. Um, whether it has right angles or primary colors or just simple good design, uh, so much is lumped into this small school. And so we know that it had, we know by this point it had essential avant-garde antecedents, it had its contemporaries, and it synthesized and popularized these. And the critique of a new formalism was already present in the school. We don't need to look to uh, Tom Wolfe or From Bauhaus to Our House and the, to, to find already the seeds of critique. But I want to take a look at Bauhaus thinking, whatever that may or may not mean, and the prescience of that thinking for today, but also its limits, its blind spots. So I want to try to show the Bauhaus is both less and more than is often thought. Less in the sense that it's a clearinghouse for avant-garde ideas, and more for containing multitudes, being plural, and having diverse strains within it. And I want to ask, and I don't think I can answer this today uh, myself, but we collectively can try, what will the Bauhaus mean for us in 2019? Over time, we've seen the Bauhaus as different things, as you've heard from a uh, distant vantage point in the US in the 1930s, we received the Bauhaus as something of a style, severed of its radical politics. In the 40s and 50s, it became a kind of new standard or orthodoxy for art education. Whereas in the 1960s and 70s, it was a model for experimental pedagogy and new media, as well as performance. But by the 80s, it's a kind of punching bag for postmodernists who are also, in predictable, edible fashion, kind of obsessed with it. At the same time, it then becomes a kind of corporate modernism, uh, precisely the kind that Tom Wolfe was aware of. 
And then in the early 2000s, excuse me, and then the 1990s, it's a kind of slick minimalism for consumer products. And maybe in the early 2000s, we've seen the Bauhaus as a model, model for the physical trappings of our digital world, and perhaps also fuel for so-called design thinking. So as a curator, I want to do uh, this examination through a set of objects. I love objects, and this is a quite personal selection. Um, and I was asked to speak about typical objects, and I thought I might actually do that, but also speak about some less typical objects. In each case, they're personal favorites, and in most cases, they come from the Bush Reisinger Museum collection at the Harvard Art Museums, and I can explain why they're all there. So I don't need to tell you much by this point about Marcel Breuer's now iconic design object, the Vasily chair, so-called club chair, which uh, really exploded the idea of what that might imply at the time of you thinking of a heavy leather stuffed chair in a room with thick carpets and curtains, perhaps filled with smoke, that this is a visually and physically light object reduced to line and plane. It separates its materials based on their function between structure and support, and like so many innovation stories, whether the garage uh, uh, epiphanies of uh, Silicon Valley founders or otherwise, it began with this idea of Marcel Breuer allegedly riding his bicycle around Dessau and thinking that the bent steel tubes of his bike might make for a really strong and light piece of furniture. But it was also prototyped. They faked it, or rather he faked it before he could make it on a mass production scale. So a plumber was initially tasked with bending these tubes into shape. And it was created in the spirit of openness at the Bauhaus, which was also, as you now, now know, full of a canny intellectual property opportunism on Breuer's part. And even as he ran away throughout his entire life from the designation of a Bauhäusler, which he uh, uh, found limiting, just as he found the designation many years later uh, as being a brutalist, uh, quite limiting, he still collected his uh, royalties for it. So maybe of more interest then is this photo montage which has been referenced. This is a kind of portfolio piece from the first issue of the Bauhaus newspaper in 1926. And you can see if you look up close uh, that it's a Bauhaus film five years long. Uh, the author is life and the, the, the rights it's promoting and the operator who's acknowledging these rights, the humble operator is Marcel Breuer. And it begins with the so-called African chair, his student collaboration with Gunther Stolzl, this exoticizing object. It continues, as you can see with, uh, on the top with this chair that clearly privileges a kind of upright posture. It has an almost punitive aspect. Uh, but it is, of course, influenced by de Stijl and the Dutch neoplasticist movement. And of course, we come to the Vasily chair, and then projecting out into the future in 19 question mark question mark, we see a sitter without a seat floating and the wonderful phrase, every year it gets better and better. Ultimately, one sits on an elastic column of air. Um, <laughs> Elastische Luftsäule, it's a very useful expression. Um, and there is that sort of techno-utopian idealism. We'll figure it out, we'll solve the problem. Um, and we might even uh, see a world of dematerialized objects in the future. So I want to show you, this is a picture of a young Marcel Breuer taken by Laszlo Moholy-Nagy, 1925, and he's showing us his hands. And I'm struck by this pose, which as has been pointed out, is not unique to Breuer or to Moholy, because late in life, this is 1975, so this is almost a decade after Marcel Breuer has designed the former Whitney Museum of American Art, you've got the same pose. So what does that mean? What's that about? Why is he showing us his hands? I would submit that it has something to do with his training, uh, not as an architect, but as uh, in carpentry and furniture, the emphasis on the tactile, the manual in manufacture, that he understood materials in a micro-architectural sense, and he understood that buildings should appreci be appreciated, as he said, with all the senses, not just the eye, also the hand. At the same time, maybe, there's something like look ma, no hands, a reference to the industrialization, standardization, automation of modern design. Or maybe it's just his signature. He's showing us his unique human mark, a bit like Herbert Beyer, who changed his own typographic monogram constantly before finally settling on a thumbprint. Uniquely, holistically his, its loops and whirls like the topographic lines of his mid-century paintings made here in Aspen. Or possibly also, as Leah suggested to me yesterday, it has something to do with the proliferation of handheld photography in the Weimar period and essentially saying something like, get out of my face, I don't want any more pictures taken. <laughs> so 
there is this moment of dematerialization. I want to show you this is Laszlo Moholy-Nagy's very famous light prop for an electric stage. It's often exhibited as a museum object, as a sculpture, but what it produced was a dematerialized light show, multicolor light show, when everything is whirring and in motion. It was, I was tasked with uh, bringing down the extension cord and plugging this into the wall at the Harvard Art Museums. Uh, a, a colleague called it an avant-garde disco ball. But one thing I want to point out about it is, you know, it's, if, you, if you give it a date, it's from 1922 to 1930. Why? Because there's this constant idea of iteration, of improvement, of multiple versions, not the single work that's signed by the painter and called finished. And that's very uh, uh, specific to this design ideal, uh, this kind of iteration. The idea of dematerialization and the sort of look ma, no hands also comes up in the so-called telephone pictures made in 1923. Here you have Maholi allegedly calling a sign painter by phone and ordering his pictures over the phone. Maholi had a piece of graph paper on one end, the sign pa painter on the other, and he dictated to him the proportions that were then made in these enamel pictures. So Maholi's hands never touched them, and this is well before we think of fabrication uh, 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 in the 1960s. Um, it's also the idea of the picture as information that can be transmitted. Uh, based on a mathematical progression from small to large. So at the same time as there's this no hands dematerialization, the artist never touching this work whose surface is totally immaculate, you have something like the so-called Tastafel, the touch board, made in Maholi Naj's class by his student, Otti Berger, who claimed that it could be read, read with the fingers bit by bit, and the result is a material alphabet. Now, this is a fairly well-known work that Maholi published uh, in his own writing. This is a less well-known work that I encountered at the Harvard Art Museums. In terms of its museum exhibition value, I'd say it's very low, it's very unassuming work. It's a Christmas and New Year's card, it's about six and a half, uh, it's about six by five inches, quite, quite small. It's typewriting on silk. Now, Oti Berga was a terrifically talented textile artist from present-day Croatia. She briefly headed the textile workshop at the Bauhaus, then she went into private practice, then she was released from her job because of the professional ban of the Nazis in 1936. She was Jewish. She spent one year in London before returning uh, to her home to help her sick mother. And I just want to show you some details of this. You see on the top left this wonderful typewriter bird, a kind of proto-emoticon, um, and her wish, uh, Merry Christmas and Happy New Year. This is 1937 from her temporary home in London. From 1938 onward, she would try to secure a visa to the United States. She tried for six years before being deported to and murdered at Auschwitz, like my great-grandparents. I want to show another fairly unassuming object from a museum curator's standpoint. This is something by Ruth Asawa made when she was at Black Mountain College. It's a rubber stamp on newsprint. This is a detail. At Black Mountain College, everyone was expected to work. It wasn't a matter of their financial circumstances. Everyone worked. She worked, for example, in the laundry room and took the rubber stamps. They had very few resources. The rubber stamp of the laundry room indicating double sheet and took a sheet of newspaper and created what I think of as a kind of typographic textile. This was given to the museum by Joseph Albers, who greatly admired Ruth Asawa as a star student and appreciated the way that this plays with figure and ground, the idea of transparency. And in a sense, you could even see it as a sort of precursor to the very famous, now famous, recently famous, uh, again, work of Ruth Asawa. Here she is here in her home in San Francisco in 1957 in this photo by her friend Imogen Cunningham. She has four children at her feet and two sculptures. A new sculpture is in the works and two more children are on the way. Her parents were Japanese immigrants. They grew up working on their farm outside Los Angeles. At 16, Asawa was sent with her family to a Japanese internment camp where she honed her drawing skills. She was denied teaching jobs because of her race, became interested in going to art school, and followed Joseph Albers to Black Mountain College. This is another work you can see on newsprint again, BMC, BMC, Black Mountain College all over. So there's something funny about what happens with these Bauhäusler. This is the, the, the famous Albers that you know of, of mid-century in the homage to the square, uh, very Bauhaus, one would think. But there's something that happens when he goes, uh, he and, and Annie Albers will go to Black Mountain College in 1933. They leave Germany. 
and this, uh, this deep connection with nature and the experience the Alberses have uh, in the mountains of North Carolina is a, maybe a bit like what the experience uh, uh, Herbert Beyer has in Aspen, Colorado. Um, but there's this deep connection. At the same time, of course, your impression of the Bauhaus as being uh, so strictly orthogonal, almost, uh, almost uh, a parody of itself is not incorrect. This is Josef Hartwig uh, making a chess set and trying, of course, to telegraph the function of each chess piece in the design of each form. Now, of course, that assumes that people know a bit about chess, so this whole universal design thing rides roughshod over many cultural uh, uh, differences, but even the idea that this is the simple, uh, simplest expression of these functions is belied by the multiple versions of it, that maybe actually this is a better one or a different one. Uh, but there are these very beautiful products that are then marketed uh, uh, by the school. Um, Hartwig goes crazy with this idea that geometry can become a symbol and a universal language. He creates this uh, system of symbols, and one is to understand without words the difference between, uh, based on signage, what a doctor's office is, what a nurse would be, uh, uh, a dentist, all based on some variation on the square, perhaps the circle, maybe the triangle. At the same time as there's that uh, a deep rationalist, functionalist, orthogonal uh, sensibility that you associate with the Bauhaus, here's a drawing at the Harvard Art Museums that I, I fell in love with by Paul Clay from 1921 called Apparatus for the Magnetic Treatment of Plants. Now, Paul Clay was smart enough not to really fall for ideas of animal magnetism or 18th century pseudoscience, mesmerism, but this is a really playful composition, and you, and you might also know his even more famous drawing, The Twittering Machine, a bit of technological prescience in the title, uh, from 1923, which is at the Museum of Modern Art. And of course, the question of the human relationship to nature and the machine is already inscribed in this. You can ask when you look at it, is the bird song here sweet, or do they screech against their shackles? Does the machine obviate the animals, or do they perch triumphant on a defunct device? But also, who turns the crank? Moreover, how does Paul Clay, a self-styled Swiss mystic painter, one of the longest serving members of the Bauhaus, how does he relate to the technocratic culture of the Bauhaus? As we learned, uh, Johannes Itten had a, a large hand in bringing people like Clay and Kandinsky, but how does that work? How does someone uh, who is in this picture, I would argue, in some ways even satirizing the machine, coexisting with these techno-utopians of the Bauhaus? I think it's an interesting question I won't try to answer, but I think there's a modicum of what we would call today a bit of trolling, that is to say, uh, that the machine maybe can't solve everything, and maybe there are some things that we, as humans, are still straining to understand. But that less rational side uh, that Libby also talked about persists in other ways. I wanted to show you, you know, when the Bauhaus comes to America, this is a wonderful document I came across in the archives at, at Harvard's Houghton Library. Gropius is invited to come to Harvard. This is the uh, uh, telegram, right, telling him, welcome to America where happiness and success await you. It's quite beautiful. This is from Joseph Hudnut, who's uh, invited him to become the chair of the arch architecture department at Harvard, and it's prescient, it's quite prescient. Gropius will build a house for himself in 1937 in Lincoln, Mass, about 30 minutes drive from Cambridge, and it becomes a kind of calling card for him, a proof of concept, a really strikingly modern foray uh, as far as American standards are concerned. But what I'm struck by in the Gropius house is the mementos, the curios, the objects on his desk, the things that an exile uh, or an emigre we should say, brings with him or her. So in this very modern house with this beautiful curved glass block wall and the Maholi Naj on the wall and the Breuer table on the floor, you then see Breuer, uh, excuse me, Gropius's small office. And what I'm struck by is the painting on the far end. It's actually a uh, late 1920s painting by Zanti Shavinsky, who's been mentioned as this kind of Bali, uh, Bauhaus polymath, performer, uh, gadabout, uh, who is, um, here, making this, he calls it fließend architecture, a fl flowing architecture, this kind of proto-postmodern composition where architectural fragments are levitating, the color palette is pastel. It's something that I find quite ahead of its time in its playfulness. So again, the sort of seeds of other thinking already present to the Bauhaus. What else is on, uh, on, on Gropius' desk? Here it is. There's also these wonderful objects, and I, I don't want to click by too quickly, that you can see, uh, rather small, you can see these small curios. These curios are by Carl Aubuck, 
the son of a Viennese bronze smith who studied in Vienna with Johannes Itten, who take, took him to the Bauhaus in 1919. Uh, he took Itten's four course, then joined the metal workshop, and then he went back to his father's workshop in 23. So these are from mid-century, these are from the 1950s, but he made these paperweights, these corkscrews, uh, uh, ashtrays, the materials are now brass, bamboo, leather, stone, rattan. They have a surrealist inflection, they have a highly tactile aspect, so that too, we could say, is coming from some kind of Bauhaus thinking. That uh, uh, playfulness, that surrealist dreaminess is of course present with our very own Herbert Beyer. This is a work from 1928 at the Harvard Art Museums. And so I think understanding Beyer means understanding both the orthogonal uh, and the functional, but also the dreamy and the surrealist. So you have these uh, sort of flat cut out fish floating on clouds but then you also have his universal typeface, the so-called universal typeface. And this is a drawing in gouache. If you look closely, you can see the compass points punctured in the paper by which he constructed these forms. And you can see that some of the letters aren't yet quite finished. So again, this idea of iteration, improvement, an update, a new, a new version uh, for legibility, he would argue. And I wanted to say a bit about the many faces of Bayer. Uh, this is from Ameri you know, this is from the U.S. Uh, but of course, he is a uh, self-styled alpinist, a uh, rugged figure who's deeply in touch with the outdoors. Our very own Herbert Bayer could also be called a bit of a Bauhaus bro, uh, with all of the kind of uh, uh, athleticism, uh, revelry, and maybe light chauvinism that implies. Here he is on the left. Uh, Zanti Shavinsky is on the right. They're hamming it up. But he's also a kind of typographic clinician, we could say. This is him in private practice in Berlin, wearing his white lab coat, ready to dispense prescriptions for companies on how to capture attention in a consuming media economy. I'll say something about these in a second. But I also wanted to show Bayer in his suit because he really did think that the artist should not be the bohemian on the sidelines, but rather should be seated at the table, should be a major decision maker. And you see over his, uh, on our right, in the upper right, you see a small painting. And this is him working on that painting here in Aspen. So to bring this talk up to date a bit and, and up to the place where we are, I want to say a brief word about a couple projects all around 1950, all around mid-century. So this work that you're seeing in progress became this work, which was recently installed, uh, triumphantly restored and installed at the Harvard Art Museums. It's about six feet tall, 19 and a half feet across, stretched oil on canvas. It was called Verdur. It was commissioned by Walter Gropius, who designed the Harvard Graduate Center, the first modern building on campus, and who included Bayer to integrate art into architecture. And it was at first maligned by students who held a naming contest for what it should be called. One of them called it Nausea at Noon. I would submit, though, that Bayer still achieved some of his aims in making this work. What were his aims? His aims were to first get students talking about modern art. They certainly did. His aims, as Siegfried Gideon put it, were to work on the underdeveloped optic psychic nerves of the students, these logocentric students who knew nothing of modern art, but also to illustrate the idea of growth, the phenomenon of change and flux. He, as a romantic, wanted to re-romanticize, even mysticize, the process of plant growth which is, of course had been explained by botanists, but he wanted to get some of the magic back into that and illustrate it. So it is, uh, this is the build, on the left is the building at Harvard, on the right is the Bauhaus building, it's a generous juxtaposition, uh, but that's where, the, that's where the building, uh, the painting was rather, and this was the site for it, uh, below a clear story window with actual verdure outside. But what I wanna highlight is that this represents, for Bayer, not an anthropocentric view with the human at the center, but a geologic vantage point. The idea of representing mountains and convolutions, and this is something Bernard represented beautifully in his exhibition here, the idea of seeing plant growth and seeing mountains, seeing a long durée, uh, looking at a landscape and imagining mountains in motion, takes us out of an anthropocentric view and puts us into this geological one um, that is, uh, somehow before or after or otherwise without humans. And you can see some examples of this and it becomes his work. Uh, uh, it relates closely to his graffito work here in Aspen. The Great Ideas of Western Man series is also something that Walter Pepke invites Bayer to do uh, uh, around this time as well. As you know, 
buyers invited to Aspen uh, in the late 40s. Um, this, uh, um, of course, the earthworks also come out of these uh, mountains and convolutions and their topography. This is a, uh, a booklet for a traveling exhibition of the great ideas of Western man. You can see my mother's uh, maiden name on the left and her, her inscription from when she was a freshman in high school, I believe, when she picked up this work, uh, this pamphlet, which is now in my personal library, and I'm coming back around to it. But Mortimer Adler, uh, he of great books fame from the University of Chicago, selected many thinkers, great uh, Western men, mostly Western, mostly men. And in over 200 works, uh, a buyer was asked to pair an idea from Western liberal philosophy uh, on whether it was uh, self-government or the rights of, 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 of people um, with an artist. And so he did that. And I just want to show you very briefly uh, some of the works that came out of this. And these were printed in enormous quantity and published in Time Magazine, in Business Week. So you have John Locke, uh, illustrated by Ben Shahn, Herodotus and Paul Rand, Thomas Jefferson and Herbert Beyer, Immanuel Kant and Max Bill, John Dewey and Egbert Jakobsen, Socrates and Jurgi Kepisch, Emerson and Herbert Beyer, John Ruskin and Alvin Lustig, Abraham Lincoln and Beyer, John Stuart Mill and Saul Bass, Marcus Aurelius and Jacob Lawrence. The last project I wanted to talk about is also happening at exactly this time and is also completely intimately related. And that's the World Geographic Atlas. It's a large format 400 page book published in 1953 and the subtitle says a lot. The composite of man's environment. So you see these spheres converging, these multiple disciplines converging on or perhaps emanating from as human disciplines, man or the human. So in this case, this is man at its center. This is an anthropocentric view and it's a highly rationalizing one. This is buyer in facts and figures and beautiful maps illustrating how the world works. These really gorgeous spreads that he made. And he worked on it over five years. He wasn't a scientist, he said, but a visualist. And there you see these novel cartographic projections, many of them without borders, and it was a response to the book of the future. Uh, it was against the gray monotony of the page. And you see some of his meteorological uh, 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 illustrations, maybe how they fed into some of his painting at the time. So why would an atlas have been made? Well, there's a post-war new world order that the atlas acknowledges. In its preface, it talks about swiftly spreading global communications, interdependence forcing us to consider the world as one. In fewer words, globalization. But also the atlas contains a surprising prescient admonition about the risk of, as it says, destruction of natural resources, as being, and, and no problem being more urgent today than the conservation and wise use of natural wealth. And as I learned recently, uh, Walter learned so much about both modern art and conservation, actually from Elizabeth Pepke. But it was really a striking project because it represents the CCA, uh, Container Corporation of America, as a leader in resource conservation. And it meshed with Bayer's own environmental commitments. He talked a lot about environment in visual, spatial, and ecological terms, and the human power to change it. Also, its fragility. So this book is an early document of a new era, indeed a new geological era, shaped by human activity, a time when nature and human culture bleed into one another, known today as the Anthropocene, an era whose onset scholars generally agree dates to just this time, for the massive increase in fossil fuels and also the dawn of the nuclear age. And here, I just picked one, is Florida. So what do we make of this project? It's a lovely idea, I think, to think not like a person or a corporation or a nation, but like a planet. To think environment in the broadest terms, without bounds. And Pepka's aim, as I understand them, and I don't profess to know them intimately, with the ads, with the atlas, with the institute, was to educate leaders, to educate global elites, especially captains, captains of industry, to be good stewards of their environment, to be here in Aspen and bathe in the mountain air, to bathe in great ideas of philosophy, and to be stewards and, in a sense, self-regulate their actions rather than, say, be regulated. So it's with some sadness that I would say that this didn't entirely and completely work out as planned. So I want to close on a personal note. 
And I want to ask, what is it about the Bauhaus that we so love? And by the we, I very much include myself. Why are we so obsessed with it? And I would like to suggest, not just the centennial bringing it on, but it's partly the allure of the Bauhaus, the beauty of it, the fun, the sheer vibrancy of this moment, but also the poignancy of the Bauhaus, that there was this cultural efflorescence in Weimar Germany that was then crushed. But maybe also there's a feeling of valor that we can have, that this noble project was shut down by dark forces, and so the enemy of my friend is also my enemy. But being cosmopolitan and despised by fascists does not make one anti-fascist. Many of our heroes in this story were apolitical at best. So I've been quite susceptible to all of these Bauhaus charms. And I want to say, in closing, a quick word about Bayer, who has uh, been a constant source of fascination for me as an extraordinary, multi-talented artist, designer, and architect. It's been mentioned, his, his work for the Nazis, um, his exhibitions for or under the Nazis, the major propaganda campaigns in 1933, in 34, in 35, in 36, and 37. And these have been known for years. Scholars in particular have been talking about them in the last five years. They've been less discussed here in Aspen. And it is complicated, but I also want to suggest in some ways it's a bit simpler. We're talking here about substantial and, substa substantial and sustained complicity with fascism. And so whatever was in his heart, we can only judge deeds. And he knew at the time everything he needed to, just as we do know now. He knew after years of the racialist and eugenic rhetoric and policy, his friends or neighbors losing their businesses, or maybe their freedom or lives. And so I want to say that one always has a choice. So I don't want to fixate on Bayer, but I also don't want to ignore him either. So forgive me for speaking plainly. If we can't be frank about something more than 80 years ago, I worry. I worry about the present. I worry about the present administration as its revolving door disgorges designers and architects, architects of walls and cages, travel bans and disenfranchisement, pointless wars and a total assault on the natural world, many of whom will seek to come here and mingle and launder their reputations in precisely a place like this. One always has a choice. So here we are in one of the most breathtakingly beautiful places I've ever seen. Here we are in one of the most breathtakingly beautiful places I've ever seen. As you know, wildfires, floods, and hurricanes are the new normal. Every city I've lived in since my graduation, San Francisco, New York, and Boston, will be underwater well within my lifetime. Soon many US cities will be unlivably hot, as many already are in East Asia, the Mideast, and North Africa. And we know all this, we've known all this. Half of the carbon emitted in the, human, in the history of humanity has happened since Al Gore's inconvenient truth. So apologies for this inconvenient truth. Herbert Beyer's design of the seminar building, its hexagonal plan, is based on a round table, the metaphor of open, free, and fair marketplace of ideas. It's now named for David Koch, the paragon of dark money, funder of bad faith science, indeed intellectual dishonesty, whose erstwhile enterprise still refines almost one million barrels of oil per day. But to be clear, I'm not just talking about Coke. I'm also thinking about, it's too easy, I'm thinking about the incrementalist, corporatist, so-called moderate solutions that are only incrementally different. And so, in closing, all of this puts me a bit in mind of Anand Girid Haridas, who spoke on this stage a few years ago. He was speaking before the current administration. He was talking about the grotesque wealth inequality in this country rather than climate crisis, although the two are intimately intertwined. He spoke of an Aspen consensus to do good philanthropically, socially, certainly but to never contemplate doing less bad. So I'd ask you here, in a call that would be pointless in almost any other setting, to divest from the fossil fuel death cult and from the neo-fascism taking root in this country, to divest financially and to divest socially. It seems to me academic, and I say that as an academic, whether you think that today it's 1934 or 1935 or somehow perhaps 1937. We know everything we need to know and one always has a choice. Forgive me and thank you.